Just wait for another minute, and then we'll do introductions. When I say minute, I never actually mean a minute. Um, I always go much quicker than that. So what, we'll begin. Uh, so greetings, uh, my name's Brad Lundahl. I am happy to kind of bring together a panel of some people I respect deeply. Uh, they'll each be able to introduce themselves here in a minute. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about this idea of how to engage in, in counseling settings, so micro practice uh, in terms of cultural humility and diversity. So that will be the goal. Uh, this is brought to you from eSimPro.com, where we're trying to uh, just introduce ideas that are helpful, particularly around motivational interviewing. We won't talk about that much today. Um, so why don't we uh, each introduce ourselves, and then Tina is going to kind of help moderate our conversation. So we'll go from there. Awesome. I guess I'll get started. My name is Tina Molini. I'm a professor at Weber State University in the social work program. Um, I have my master's in social work. I work a lot with Pacific Islander community, as well as um, I teach the diversity courses at Weber, so I love engaging and working with diverse populations and groups. And I myself, my mom, my dad is from the beautiful islands of Tonga, and my mom is from the beautiful islands of Idaho. And so I come from a blended mixed background, and I, I just love learning about culture and people and all of those different things. So that is me. I'll follow suit. So my name is Steve V. E. Hill, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker uh, and also working with Tina at Beaver State University. Uh, I teach courses in the DSM-4. Um, I also, my practice is actually part-time working at a McKady Institute of Behavioral Medicine, where I work with individuals struggling with depression, anxiety, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder. Uh, and I also specialize in the treatment of borderline personality disorder. Um, the other populations that I service are the LGBTQQI community, uh, which I also belong. Uh, my upbringing is my father is a full-blooded uh, Ute Indian. We hail from the Mountain Ute tribe in Southern Colorado, Northern New Mexico. Uh, and my mother hails from the ancient Aztec lands. Uh, so she is the Latino side. So I grew up uh, uh, being also of a mixed race, uh, being uh, from the Native American Indian culture, as well as the Latino Latina culture. So that's me in a nutshell. Martha, you want, you want to go? Or you want... Go, yeah, okay. So my name is Martha Mendez. I'm a certified social worker. Next month will be a licensed um, social worker, so I'm very excited. I'm also a certified advanced substance use disorder counselor. Right now I practice mainly um, with trauma, um, sexual, assault, sexual assault survivors mainly, at Compass Counseling and Consulting with Brad. I also do have a channel, a YouTube channel called Viviendo Mejor, uh, con Marta, where I share videos for healing and tools for sexual assault survivors in Spanish, and they're free. Um, I also uh, am part of a committee. It's the Utah Behavioral Health Planning and Council Committee in the, uh, the Racial and Ethnic Equity and Integration Committee at the Utah Department of Human Services. Uh, I was born and raised in Mexico, but I lived most of my life now here in the United States in, in Utah. So that's me. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Kampany Kivongsa. Um, I currently live in Boston, and um, I, I'm a private practitioner, licensed clinical social worker, and I work in the Cambridge area servicing um, the young adult college population and, and couples. Um, um, my background actually is in um, addiction recovery, and so mainly uh, sex addiction and, and infidelity, uh, things around there. Um, uh, Background-wise, actually, uh, my family and I are from Laos. I came to uh, America in like 1991 um, through the refugee program. So, um, you know, my fascination with 
just social work in general has, uh, has come from an early age as my family have been recipients of many uh, social services. Um, part, part of why I wanted to become a social worker to begin with. Um, so yeah, very happy to be here. Um, I work a lot with the uh, East Asian, Southeast Asian population um, and, and, and yeah, and, and quite a bit of people in the black community and, and have really, yeah, I've had a lot of fun working with these populations here. So. Good to meet everyone. Awesome. Thank you all for introductions and that we got to know a little bit more about each of you. Um, like Brad mentioned, I will be moderating this discussion and we're just going to jump right into it. Um, as you notice, our title is Tabo To Do's and Taboos. And so we kind of want to start off with what should we do? So what are to do's? When you meet um, clients from diverse backgrounds, cultures, what's some of the things that you recommend to do? when you're working with these clients. Um, Stephen, can we start with you? <laughs> so part of my practice, again, is working with children, adolescents, and adults. And I will say that my adult uh, community uh, at times is, again, very uh, heterosexual biased. And so at times, even in the introductory process, when we're getting to know each other and build rapport, um, I think some of the initial roadblocks that I've encountered as a clinician, as especially as an LGBTQQI clinician, uh, is the assumption that I myself am heterosexual. And so they will often ask the initial question, so tell me about your wife. Uh, that initial awkwardness uh, that can occur in that first initial meeting, I think uh, the to-do, uh, what I've discovered uh, is to demonstrate authenticity, uh, that if I'm asking my consumers to be honest as part of treatment, I think at times then I equally have to demonstrate what honesty looks like. Uh, as a clinician, however, there are costs. Has it cost me clients? Absolutely. Um, especially when working with young kids in the industry, uh, that yes, I am a trained clinician working with young children. However, through heterosexual bias, they still at times have difficulty wanting a gay individual to work with children. And so I think to address what potentially those biases are, to demonstrate that level of authenticity um, is actually pretty important in the beginning of a treatment process with the consumer. Awesome, thank you. Martha, will you take the next? What are some to-dos that you're going to so It sounds like Steve is saying authenticity um, in the beginning so that you're authentic with your clients so that they can feel authentic with you. What about you? I, I would say some of the to-dos is also, uh, at least for me, even though I'm Latinx, I'm Mexican, I don't know other cultures, right? Argentinian culture is different than Mexican culture, and it's just a whole rainbow of things. So I think a to-do thing is not to pretend I know it all just because I'm Mexican, even with my clients who are also Mexican. So... I would say respectful curiosity helps me a lot. So I don't assume things. And when I notice I'm assuming things in my head, I, that's like a warning sign that, uh, okay, it's time to practice that respectful curiosity and, and ask clients, right? Because not also um, they're learning from me, I'm learning from them. It's a, it's a part of therapy, I would say, to try as much as you can respectfully and with consent to be part of your client's world so then we can navigate that together. I like that. I, one of the things that I love about MI is um, one of the things that I learned way back in my master's was the client is the expert in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And anytime my students do diversity and we, we they have a change maker project, part of it is don't assume you know, ask them, like, let them tell you, they're, they, they're their experts, you're there to listen and to find out what it is they value and then connect there. And so I really like that. I like the authenticity and then moving on to then connect with them. Let them tell me who they are. I'm not going to tell you who you are, but I will help you move to where you want to be, right? So I really like that. Thanks, Martha. All right, Kev, Fiddy, we're to you, to do. Yeah, yeah, um, a lot of good answers there. I want to piggyback up what Martha said. Um, I think, like, I guess this idea of working within the context of, of their their beliefs, their systems, right? Um, 
you know, for, for example, I work in working with a lot of Eastern cultures, they, um, you know, sh shamanism or spiritual leaders or um, consulting spiritual practitioners, that, that's a huge part of, um, that's part of their culture and development, right? And, and it's, it's the idea of working in that context, right? Like, you know, Western culture, we're very individualistic and, you know, um, in working with young adults, like in the Western narrative is, hey, be the individual, defy your parents, you know, um, be your own person. Uh, but that's not the case in Eastern cultures, right? Is that there's mm -hmm. deference for your elders and respect for, uh, you know, spiritual leaders. And, and I think the therapy should, should be executed within that context, that understanding and what Martha's saying, having this, uh, I guess, humility is understanding to, to, to step back and to not assume coming from my own ideologies about how, how they should proceed, you know, with dealing with challenges in their life. Right. So, yeah, I, no, I love that. And I, um, I, I completely relate to that idea. Part of my research right now is on Pacific Islanders in higher education. And one of the big things that we're seeing is collectivism, right? This idea that they want to be individuals, but they're still so much connected to their families. And so you have to work with both in order to help them navigate and to succeed. And so I think that's a pretty powerful statement. So thank you. Awesome. Um, Brad, did you want to chime in to some of these to do's? I know um, you also work with multiple different types of clients. And so some thoughts, some ideas. Yeah, I, I, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's a, there's a lot to think about. I think what I try to do is try to embrace this idea of cultural humility, not knowing and even to the point of saying, I'm not sure. So when there's someone with a difference that shows up, like, I, I don't even know at times, like, is this, uh, how relevant is this to our work together? Is it primary? Is it secondary? Is it, you know, how does it fit in? And so I'll, I'll be curious with them about how, you know, whatever aspect of diversity is being introduced into our work together. So a lot of it's just trying to ask, um, although I'm, I'm interested what other people think about this idea, I even get sensitive about asking. So let's say someone comes in that announces that they have some difference from me in some way, from who I am. Um, then I, I wonder, you know, well, if it's not announced, excuse me, now I'm, I'm bumbling a little bit here. If it's a not, not announced, do I address, you know, the topic and does that bring a highlight to it in a way that's helpful or unhelpful or do I let the client bring it up? So I don't, what do you all think about that idea? Like, um, to what degree do we take the lead in introducing and highlighting topics of difference, or do we allow the clients to introduce those on their own timing? If I may, um, add to, I, I, I think, well, nothing, but what I've done is I just kind of have a feel with that client that it's in front of me, right? Um, it's not like a rule for me to do either one. It's if I notice, if I can read, also like listening to your body, right? If you notice there's like some, I think would say the first time clients meet me because I do have an accent when I speak English, you know, and then I'm, I'm Latina, I cannot hide that. So I've had not very often, I would say only like twice the time that I've been practicing that I could notice and feel in my body that the client it's uncomfortable um it's and then i bring it up because it's already on the table <laughs> i think like my role as a therapist is in a way just picking that up and then not assuming again but asking respectfully i'm noticing this um what is there anything you would like to say and then Sometimes I was totally wrong because I also have, I would say with um, generational trauma and microaggressions, I also need to understand that I am biased too and I'm a human. And sometimes things that I see, it's more about me than the client. So I, I, I do strongly believe that's why I, will, I don't like assuming. I pick that up check with the client respectfully and if it's something that they're saying oh no i'm just nervous and that's okay perfect so then but then i let them know there's always a window open if there's anything you would like to talk about let, let's let's talk about it i'm i'm open to it 
I will, I will say that more than not, because again, I work with children and adolescents and looking at the developmental stage of, of children and adolescents, the sense of belonging becomes essential to their development. And so when difference manifests, uh, whether that be along the line of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, uh, these are targets for kids and their self-esteem. And when I take a look at what's happening in our school environment, uh, these are hot topics that kids are being bullied with, uh, creating episodes of depression, anxiety, suicidality. And when we take a look at specifically like what we're doing in Utah to try to reduce the suicide rate, um, it becomes essential that we make these uh, areas uh, important topics in the treatment process. And so if an individual is African American or they identify as Black American, to be able to ask those questions, how do you self-identify? How do these issues, uh, uh, are they uh, positive or negative in your social environment? How do they affect your development? How do they affect your ability to belong? Uh, are you being bullied? Uh, as a way of identifying how these things affect their social development and their sense of belonging. Uh, I think for the populations that I work with, uh, I try to make it a topic of conversation to see if it matters to them and if it needs to be addressed in a course of treatment. I will also say that it excites me to no end that organizations are finally recognizing in their initial paperwork the importance of recognizing gender and non-binary individuals. So to be able to put a checkbox that I identify as gay or lesbian or transgender uh, and to be able to make, again, it easy to identify who the populations are so that we can make these topics of conversation in the clinical process. I like I, that. Go ahead, Martha. I was saying, I think we have a question from Jennifer that is along the lines as what Stephen was talking. Right, and, and um, I, Thank you, Martha. I just saw that too. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to read, is that okay for Ed if I read her question? Um, I've struggled with clients who actively speak against LGBT community because there's someone in their life who is part of that community. My instinct is to say, mm, this isn't a right fit, but I worry that's unethical. What would you advise in, the, in those cases? So I believe that everything has a purpose. Uh, so because again, every population that I work with, whether it be an adaptive behavior or a maladaptive behavior, there's something that this individual is struggling, struggling with. And from my perspective, it, it's important uh, for me to pursue that with that patient. What is their belief system and, and why is it that they're believing that way? Uh, what is it about their development? You know, is this an indication that they maybe were a victim of trauma? by someone of the same gender. And this is why they have developed such a harsh uh, ideology or paradigm against this population. Or are they themselves equally identifying with being same gender retracted and they are then struggling with self-acceptance? So what I love about things along this line is it now behooves me to really go on an adventure with a patient and try to explore why they are feeling the way that they're feeling. Um, and see if it's necessary to engage them in that change process, whatever, whatever that may be. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we also have a comment from Julie um, who says, I think it is also important to take into account characteristics, beliefs that may not be apparently be apparently different between therapists and clients as part of not assuming. Um, and so I Thank you, Julie. I appreciate your comment in saying that the client is the expert, whatever that is, and not assuming where background they come from that you're automatically going to have a connection just because I'm Pacific Islander. I may not connect with all Pacific Islanders, right? And I'm not going to, but I need to know from their lens what that looks like. Uh, Jennifer Jones also posted, for me, it's always been that these clients are LDS and this is the way that they were taught. I struggle exploring this when it's not the issue of therapy. One thing that I want to say, Jennifer, is I teach a lot of students in my diversity class who are LDS, um, and, I, and I, I appreciate what they bring to the table, and we have these conversations, and many of them 
for one of my class, we have what's called a change maker project where they have to step into their discomfort and learn from someone different. And one of their, many of them choose the LGBT population. And after they do their change maker and interview people from the population and get to know their lens, they actually recognize we have more similarities and differences. And that helps them to step a little bit further into having more candid conversations. And so I love it because uh, Stephen actually comes, Steve comes and presents in my classes and shares his personal lens and his personal story. And it's so powerful, especially for my students who don't connect with the LGBT community to recognize that people are people and we get to work with all people from diverse backgrounds. Um, any other thoughts from the panel? Well, I love that question in that it really puts us in a, a dichotomous realm that we're either this or this. And thank you for mentioning uh, me coming into your class because what I try to present in the class uh, that I that I guess speak at for your student is I'm more than just an LGBTQQI individual. I'm a Ute Indian. I'm Latino. I actually was raised in the LDS Church. Got married in the temple. Got divorced. A part of my soul is still very much LDS, and so this concept of intersectionality, uh, I think, needs to. Uh, be embraced when we're dealing with people. It's not putting us in these individual boxes and, and, and we're this, this time, and this, this time. It really is a synthesis. When I, when I take a look at cultural competency and the to-dos of what we need to do as clinicians is to help individuals synthesize what society tries to do to us and, and compartmentalizes us and really synthesize these worlds that get us into a more holistic way of being. And so, yes, I'm very religious, I'm very spiritual, I'm very native, a part of me is still very LDS. Uh, I still have food storage, you know, you can't take the Mormon out of the gaze when I tell my <laughs> folks, you know, it, I, I am who I am, and now let me just share that story. And getting to know, you know, other populations, I think we shorten the chasm between us. You know, I bleed just like you bleed. Uh, two years ago, I lost my spouse. You know, I grieve like you grieve. I ache like you ache. Um, we had four kids together. Uh, don't ask how. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. But, you know, we grieve like you grieve. We've loved like you've loved. We've raised our children the best we could, just like you've raised your children. And so to synthesize those worlds and recognize that we really are not that far different, um, I think is very helpful. I've also worked with uh, a client that comes to mind, and this was not regarding uh, LGBTQ plus communities, but it was instead, um, she was a white woman and we were working on, on complex PTSD. And then um, there was some um, comments she would have here and there about Latinx and her partner was Latinx. So being that her partner was Latinx, this client felt that with almost like the entitlement to have these comments openly because then she was not biased, right? Her partner was Latinx. So um, going with what, what Jennifer is saying, um, it was difficult for me at times to navigate that because that was nothing to do with what we were working on. I had to, like I mentioned, take that, um, check with her because I didn't want to assume. And I would notice I would get the, uh, like, I would feel in my body, like the fence mechanisms, you know? And um, long story short, we came to an agreement that if it was okay with her, I, I would point things out and, and challenge her a little with the incongruencies of the message she was sending and perhaps because she was also having interpersonal uh, relationship issues and with her partner as well. And then that actually slowly but surely, I, I worked with her for like almost three years, it began to raise, like, raise her awareness a little of how some comments, even though they were not intended to be that way, were hurting. And then um, it helped at times for her to step back and actually notice how her partner was changing in, her, in his uh, demeanor when after she said a comment. So then she would say, okay, 
what Martha is saying, like Martha's not crazy, actually. I, I'm, I'm starting to notice in vivo that I'm, I'm hurting these relationships that mean a lot to me. So, but again, it took time. That was not my goal, but I asked her if it was okay with her that whenever I would notice things like that, if I could bring it up, because at that point we had a relationship already. And I did mention, right, I'm, I'm a human too. And I, I opened up with her and I said, sometimes I feel hurt. And I notice, and I'm, I know you're a wonderful person because again, it, we have intersectional, I, I, um, the interse intersectionality of identities. She's not only that. And that's something I had to work with within myself as a therapist. Okay, Martha, she's not only, she doesn't only have that perspective, she's way more than that. She has, she's a mother, she's this, she's that, and she's doing great and trying her best. And, and that would help me to just stay real with her and compassionate as well. And maybe that's why it also helped her to open up a little more with me because I, I, was, I was not judging, but I, I was not also quiet either. So just modeling that as well on how to have a vulnerable conversation without attacking each other and feel compassion for each other and try to see each other as more than that. Thank you, Martha. Cassidy, Brad, is there anything you wanted to add to that as well? Oh, I think this is amazing. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Me as well. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. I appreciate it. Um, let's move. So we got some of the to-dos. We know we want to be authentic. We know we want to listen, truly listen, let the client be the expert. We also know we want to be culturally sensitive and find out what they value. What are they connected to? How does that play into their system? And, and truly listen to what they have to say, but let them lead us and be the cultural experts. Um, and I, I think those are all powerful things, but now we got to get to the juice of the conversation, which is the fun part, and it's the taboo. What not to do? What's the, what's the no-go? What's, the, the, what's like the danger zone, stay away, let's, let's move a little bit back. What, what are some things that you recommend that um, as clinicians or individuals working with diverse cultures and populations, what should we veer away from? Campity, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, you know, it's, um, I mean, obviously, one big one is just making assumptions. It's probably, I'm sure there's a phrase that goes with that, right? Um, and I think, I think just learning even from personal experience, right, what not to do. Um, I'm embarrassed to say this, but uh, I, um, I'm just going to share an anecdotal story that, uh, of what not to do. And I, I was, um, <laughs> I had a client who, uh, it was just the first time I saw them, but I, um, but they, we were scanning, I was scanning their ID card and unknowingly I just said, oh, wow, you know, like, um, I it just, I don't know whether that's like hair or something. I just said, oh, wow, yeah, that's you basically saying like, yeah, it looked different. You know, this is some stylistic thing. I, I didn't mean anything by it, but that, that person was offended. And, and it was, is totally like, you know, slap myself in the wrist, probably slap myself in the face. Um, and, and it was a really important lesson for me to step back because I could sense there was just like, oh, you know, and anyways, from that moment on, it was, it was such a valuable lesson of just like really not making assumptions, even, I don't know, pointing things out like that. Like, um, like I said, I, I didn't mean anything by it. It was probably just like a hairstyle or something, but but even then, you know, just really having this kind of awareness and and and, and not making these brass assumptions about what they believe, what they feel, um, um, you know, what they like or dislike, right? Like, I think um, it's a minor thing, but I think it goes a long way. And uh, that's maybe a superficial example, but it goes deeper than that, right? Just um, sort of what Stephen was saying, like, not making these assumptions about orientation or where they're coming from or their understanding because I think most of our assumptions just come from our personal belief system right like where, where, where do we operate our assumptions from is just from what I know and uh, that that isn't necessarily correct so like, it's, it's more just kind of a feel uh, towards that that I found to be very helpful 
Awesome. Thank you, Kampany. Martha, you want to, so I, I hear, what I hear is assumptions. Don't make assumptions. Again, let them tell you who they are. Um, and I often, I, I like it that you say that because a lot of people make assumptions, even when they're like, oh, you're, you're Tongan, do you know so-and-so? And, -so? and <laughs> right, this idea that automatically you're going to know the whole country. And now, small world, unfortunately, Utah, if you tell me a Tongan name, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I know that family. They're from this village. But normally, right, you're, you can't make the assumption that you know where they're all from. So I really like that. Don't assume and just kind of get to know them. Great. Martha, what are some taboos? What should our people out there that are listening to this webinar like steer away from? Um, I, I wrote some notes as uh, um, by hearing uh, Kathy was inspiring. So thank you. I'm like, oh, okay, now I have some ideas here. <laughs> but I would say um, try your best to not get defensive. If the client brings up uh, something that you said or did that was hurtful or make them made them feel uncomfortable. I would say a great part, at least with my clients being um, uh, trauma survivors, many of them are very hesitant to share that. So number one, they're sharing that with me. That takes a lot of energy from most of my clients because they are risking that they may damage the relationship. So I try to just see that as they are feeling a little more comfortable with me, that they're opening up. So instead of taking that personal or feeling defensive, actually see it, trying to see that on the positive side and in, in something you can use to work with uh, as a tool to actually get to how was your experience to tell me or to share with me what you just did. Um, how hard was it for you or how does it, how is, how is it like for you? First of all, what were you expecting? I would say, I often get the, uh, I was expecting that you were, were going to shut down. You wouldn't want to see me anymore. I'm like, okay, okay. But then let's try to think about another instance where that has happened. Right. And, and, and then we just kind of dig a little bit deeper and then I would say, how was it for you to hear me say, uh, I'm sorry, uh, genuinely, right? Not just like a check mark and let's move on, but genuinely, like, I, I'm very sorry. I, um, and, and trying to move on because you're, if you're over apologetic, then they are taking care of you. Then they're like, no, 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 no. It's so, and that's not the point. The point is not just like, I'm sorry. Is the, um, and then just, again, depending on your relationship, right? Um, take it from wherever you and the client want to take it to. But trying to be, again, non-defensive. Try not to get defensive and not to take it personal. And try not to over-apologize if you said something. Because this is very ingrained. Just like... A Kathy was saying it was just it was just a comment. I didn't even think about it. Right? It's very ingrained. Uh, so if something like that happens and you hurt a client or made them uncomfortable, try not to over apologize because then what's going to happen? They're going to feel the need to take care of you because now you're feeling so bad about them opening up with you, saying what you just said was hurtful or made me uncomfortable. So. Thank you, Martha. There is a comment um, that came in from the group, um, and I don't want to slaughter your name. So, Severa, I apologize if I slaughtered that. I'm going to apologize once because Martha said don't over-apologize. We understand that we don't have to be, we don't have to make assumptions or presume things about the client, but what if the client starts doing that with the practitioner? As in, if they know, if they want to know about our religious beliefs or other beliefs in general, should we correct them or do we just let it be? And so we haven't gotten to uh, Steve or Brad. Do either of you want to take that question from the panelists? I'm um, not from the panelists, from the people who are watching our panel. Brad, let's start with you. Oh, I was going to say, I love to hear from you, Steve. Every time you open my mouth, I'm just like, oh, I love to hear <laughs> Um, I, I think, well, a couple things, and I'll, let me get to this question. One, Martha, I, I really love how you talked about try really hard. Sometimes when I'm, you know, listening to the conversations around this topic, I hear don't do this or do do this. Like 
but it's real. I love the try because I think most of us are in fact trying and just honoring the fact that we're trying and that there may not be just a, a bright line of, of not crossing. Well, there are bright lines, let's be clear, but, uh, but we're really trying. I think I would, to the question uh, that Sabira is asking, I think I would just try to be curious and just try to say something along the lines, interesting, you know, you have this belief, how might that impact our work together? And, and not from a challenging perspective, not from a overly intellectualizing, but just hopefully from a lot of emotion and compassion to say, interesting, you're bringing up a question about my religion. I'm, I'm generally curious how you think that impacts our work. Um, and and then I'm, I'm willing to tell usually, like I, I haven't had a question I have not, I would not answer yet to a client. Um, and like Steve, sometimes I've lost some clients because of my belief system. I've had people say, oh, I don't wanna work with you uh, because you may not get me. I'm like, okay, and let me, you know, I don't wanna get defensive about that. Uh, how can I help you with that next step? So that's what I think I would do there. Um, yeah. Awesome. Steve, do you also want to take a stab at that one? I, I like what you were saying, Brad, in that uh, just allow, just just feel, get a feel for that, see what that is, and whether or not you're wanting to answer it, whether or not it would be helpful. I have a good friend, I love her, Her, she's also uh, in the TC program, Misty, who always says, um, you know what, it's not about me, it's about you, so let's get back to you. Yeah, <laughs> I may be crazy, I may be all these things, but you might be right, cool. But now let's get back to you because you just you you detracting from the work we do and right and so I I, I kind of like her statement of this idea of like yeah yeah I'll tell you about me but let's get back to you because we're working on you let's let's get to your goals and so Stephen see what do you think? Yeah, to me again, it's another chance to uh, help a patient peel off the layer of the onion and get to other issues of vulnerability. So if they're asking a question, uh, very rarely do I. Um, hide anything from a patient. I figure if they're vulnerable enough to ask the question, then I need to demonstrate as a clinician, what is a way to deal with this level of either conflict or concern that then can be patterned in their own life. And so uh, I will say sometimes like Brad, it's been the demise of treatment that they then say, I can't work with you. And we will then help facilitate that change to a clinician that they maybe can feel more comfortable with. I will say more than not, it actually has been beneficial. Um, I know that in, when I get lecture in your class again, um, I let them know that I listen to general conference, uh, even though I'm, my name is no longer on the records of the church. If I'm gonna work with LDS people, I believe I need to sit down and listen to general conference uh, twice a year to hear what's coming from the pulpit so that I can better help my LDS patients. And I think that at times serves a way of helping us join together in the treatment process uh, if religion becomes a topic of conversation in treatment. Thank you. Um, and going back, I, I, all of these are great ideas of how we can engage with our clients and going back to the taboo. So now we're back to you, Brad. So we've got don't assume, um, let them tell you who they are. And also I really like Martha's idea, don't be offended. When I worked in, um, I worked in the treatment center doing uh, drug and alcohol with adolescents. I remember one of the individuals that came in was they did an intake with her, and it happened to be a Pacific Islander, but it had it was a um, one of my white um, friends who was doing the intake. She came back and she was like, "Man, this girl's messed up. She got issues. You know, she's doing drug and alcohol because her grandma raised her." And I said, "What? Oh, what do you mean?" And she's like, "Yeah, I, man, her parents gave her away. I'd be messed up too." And I said, "Is that what she told you?" And she's like, no, that's not what she told me. And I said, wait a minute. In the specific, like Tongan culture and Samoan culture, it's typical for our grandparents or our aunts and uncles to raise us. So you need to go back and ask her if that's what onset, what, why she's acting out and doing this stuff. And she's like, oh, okay. And <laughs> we had a conversation the next week and she's like, oh, you were so right. It wasn't that. It was the fact that her parents took her back and then her uncle started doing things to her that he shouldn't have. And so... It was this idea of like how going back to the client, they have to tell you what this looks like. But if we make assumptions simply because we think we know, but we don't understand the culture, kind of like Camp was saying, and, and Stephen, if we don't truly learn from their lens what that looks like, we're going to struggle. And so don't assume, but also get to know it from their lens what that looks like and how they practice it. Thank you. All right, going back to you, Brad, what to not to do? What are some taboos? Well, I, I guess for me, it's around this assumption. And I, I may, uh, 
deflect the question a little bit, but I have assumptions. I have biases, these implicit biases, right? So we all know that we have them. And so I guess I'm curious, like, how do we arrest those or pump the brakes in the moment? Or so that, that would be one question. And so what not to do, I guess, is just, you know, blurt things out, which I tend to do. Um, that's so I, I would try to slow down and be pretty respectful and think, okay, how do I, you know, in, engage in this conversation? Um, as opposed to just making the assumptions. So I, I guess I'm curious, what, what do people actively do to ar arrest those biases or assumptions from coming out natively? And I'm also curious, like, when we make a mistake, because I've made those many, 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 like you talked about, Campity, like, how do we respond there? And I know, Martha, you said this idea of, so now I'm opening up too many questions, like, don't over apologize, because then we become taken care of. And it's like, oh, rats, we've reversed roles here, and that's not what I wanted to do. Anyway. Um, so I don't know if that's a great answer, Tina, but I'm, I'm really curious about how you and everyone else becomes aware of our biases or our assumptions and how do we work those so that it doesn't, uh, I guess, negatively impact the client. Okay. Who in the panel wants to say, oh, go ahead, Campity. Yes, no, please. No, no, no. Who I'm is? just going to call on someone in the panel. So you're perfect. Campity, go. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, I had this experience where... Um, this client was really, really frustrated with just the health profession in general. They had denied her medication. And she came in and um, the first thing she said was basically like, F you <laughs> to me. <laughs> and um, to your point, Brad, like at that moment, you know, I saw two roads, right? It was like, oh, I can get really defensive about this because I don't know what's going on here. And somebody just said F you to me. Um, and... On the other hand, like this curiosity that you talk about, um, and, and I don't know the mechanics of that, but I think a big part of this is like removing my self-esteem from that situation, right? Like, this is not, this, I, I, I'm not proving myself here. This is not about me remaining uh, competent or the expert or, or you know, um, defending myself, right? Like, cause really it's, it really has nothing to do with me, right? And it was interesting that like, I took a moment, breathed that in, sat with that and said, oh, wow, like, I'm really curious, you know, like, I, I totally understand if you're upset with me. I don't particularly know why, but I'd love to hear you know, what, what I might have done to, to hurt you, you know, and, and a pretty, very um, intimate conversation ensued about just, just the health profession in general, just how history of just seeking help from professionals have really not worked for her and and how rough it was and we were able to process that and so um you know i, I think i think I, w I just reiterate this idea that um it's it, i personally think it's really important to remove using therapy as a platform to measure your self-esteem I, I i think i'm speaking for myself you know i went into i became a therapist because probably of my own dysfunctions right like i feel like everybody who's a therapist has a history as to why they do right um, and of course, we're, we're working on that, right? And I think for me, it was, you know, I grew up in an environment where there wasn't a lot of validation and affirmation and, um, uh, you know, just just feeling approved of, right? And so, uh, you know, self-esteem was pretty low. And I remember becoming a therapist. It was, it was an opportunity to, like, have somebody really respect me and, and think that I was competent and, and sought my help and was grateful, right? And, I, and I, I, I'm sad to say that I, um, I really fed off of that until it, it backfired. Um, Cause if you take the good, you have to take the bad, right? And I think I, that lesson was very valuable in that just removing my self-worth from the situation and that I really should, you know, tie my self-esteem obviously to more secure places, but that I, I really shouldn't um, be very dependent on the outcomes of my clients. Cause I think that's where that counter transference really comes into play, right? And so uh, to your point, Brad, um, with that mindset, it's actually helped me personally um, to really never feel offended or be offended, even if people say, make assumptions about me. Like I, I'm, even if someone says F you, I, I actually don't really care. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, yeah, anyway, so just some thoughts there. I'm also gonna throw in to say that it's essential that we continue to be in consultation with our colleagues. Uh, I like Brad's comment of how do we become aware of our own biases? Sometimes we're not aware. And it may take us staffing cases. It may take us being vulnerable. 
uh, with our peers to, for them to be able to point out, you know, this is maybe what I'm seeing. And that's probably the piece that saddens me about maybe our, our licensure piece um, that, you know, initially they require two years post-graduation for you to be supervised. Um, I think we should be lifelong supervisors of not only ourselves, but other uh, new, new folks coming in and offer continuous supervision as part of our profession to catch these biases and to get therapy for the therapist. Yeah, I like that, uh, Steve, especially because you can, unconscious biases and biases like Martha was talking about, we don't, awareness has to come from somewhere. And a lot of times it's not until you engage in a conversation and someone says, hey, wait a minute. And you're like, oh, I didn't even recognize that was an issue because my lens, the way I was raised, this is what I know. And I love in uh, a lot, all MSW programs, I hope they're pushing this idea that policy influences practice, but so does research. And part of that research is looking at what are, what is the research saying? How is policy influencing that research? But more importantly, going out into the communities and doing your own research, getting to know individuals from these communities. Who are the people that are, are in the mental health field in this? And what are they doing to outreach to their specific communities? Or how can you engage in conversations with that to better work with your clients? And so I, I love this idea that we're never alone in this field, and so you always should be bouncing ideas off of other people of what you can do better, or, but more importantly, what am I missing? And that I, we all have unconscious bias. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, but just like unconscious bias, a thought can come, but we also have that power to not give it. We have the opportunity not to give any power to that thought, to instead let the person tell us who they are versus what this unconscious bias is throwing out there. So yeah, anyone else? I would say too, um, and, and this is something I, I try to do for myself. Uh, not everybody may agree, but I, I remember in school, um, many times we were asked um, kind of like who I was when I would put the therapist hat and who I was when I would remove it. And, um, I think what I, I've come to terms that, at least for me, I feel more comfortable and, and way more genuine when I, I don't have a therapist hat. Like, I'm this, I'm the Martha, of course, with a, not like a, the same Martha everywhere I go, because with my clients, I do have way more responsibility. Uh, but I, um, for example, if I'm going to be respecting a pronouns of them, they, I'm gonna do it everywhere. I'm not only gonna do it when I'm in front of that client. So going with what, what Brad was asking, I think a big thing for me is to try to do those things, pausing, respecting everywhere I go because it's, the biases are so ingrained in that if I start practicing that as just a part of living, it's just easier for me to do that with my clients and feel genuine and feel comfortable. Um, and I mean, way to also model and respect my clients who want to, who have the pronouns them and they, even when they're not there. I mean, I think that matters more to me that when I'm just doing it, when I'm in front of them. So it is um, a way of pausing. I also do practice a lot of mindfulness. I don't know if you see my thing, <laughs> but it's not like a part of religion, but it helps me to, first of all, I love it. It's part of like my personality too. I've kind of been that way before, but it just helps me to slow down and be okay with silence, even in session. And that's when I'm able to hear my thoughts that sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I didn't talk right away because that was no bueno. <laughs> like that could have brought us somewhere else because sometimes I give the client a chance to say something and that's after, after me just holding on my answer and that is, completely opposite to where I, I thought they were gonna go. So 
pausing, pausing, pausing for me. I call it the, I think it's Tara Brack. I don't know if you have heard about her work, but she's amazing and she calls it the sacred pause. Um, and that just lets the fire breathe. If you don't have spaces in, in, in a fire pit, in a fireplace, the fire won't breathe. So we need to pause um, to let that fire breathe in session. And then also, again, kind of like observing without judgments or thoughts and being able to have that opportunity to say, okay, this is a good one. Okay, Martha, not this one because that's, that's more about you than the client. And, and the, so it's okay to pause, it's fine. Um, I think we're often very uncomfortable with, with pausing. So we want to give an answer right away. And then when we're talking in the middle of it, we're like, ah, why am I saying this? <laughs> so, and that's nothing, that doesn't say anything wrong with us. I think we live in the Western culture that's just so go, 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 go all the time and same thing, you know, you almost feel like you have to have that answer right away. And that's a way of modeling too. I notice some of my clients now are like pausing on, give me a minute. I'm like, take your time. <laughs> yeah. I was going to practice the pause there for a minute, but I realized we're a panel, so they probably are waiting for us to go. So I like, uh, um, Kinwin put in such a simple but important point. Thank you, Martha. And I, I thank you too. I, I think silence isn't a bad thing. Anytime. I've worked with clients in the past. Also, when my students are doing their interviews, I tell them, allow the silence to be there. Part of it is maybe they're, they're thinking, they're feeling, they're all wrapped up in those emotions, but allow them to be in that moment and don't try and push an agenda, allow them to be there. And then when they're ready, bring them out, right? And have this conversation and take them where they're ready to take you and show you their lens and their story. So that's powerful. Thank you, Martha. All right. Uh, anyone else that wanted to kind of add to that part, or actually, I believe we do have, this is um, an important question that is on there for our panelists. So many of our people out there <clears throat> are wanting to know more about cultural humility. Um, Paul Arnold put, thanks, Campity, for your thoughts on trying, on tying our self-esteem to our current client success or failure. I think we all struggle when our clients make poor choices, and we feel good when they succeed. I like what you said about finding safe harbors for our self-esteem and giving that some thought. Having good professionals around you can help you too. I really liked those thoughts. Um, and, and I wanna tie that into this idea that we're never alone in this process. And that's one of the things that I, I extend to anytime I'm working with clients, especially in adolescence, is you're never alone. Let's figure out where you're at. Let's figure out your support system. Let's, um, in the Pacific Island culture, specifically the Tongan culture that I grew up in, they often will say it takes a village to raise the family, and it's true. I have eight siblings, and we have like 30 nieces and nephews, and each of us, take a, we, we take them here and there, and they're very close, and we're very close to our first cousins. This idea of, that the village is all very actively part, part of this process, and, and so with clients, I, I, I try to install that same idea that we all actively are working together, and as clinicians, you are never alone. You have supervisors or you have good friends who are willing to listen and kind of help you. I often will go to my colleagues at Weber State, Stephen is one of them, um, Dr. Tadahar is another one that I'll be calling after one of my classes or after session, I'll be like, that was a hot mess. I don't know what should happen. Oh my goodness. And they're like, you are a hot mess girl, but calm down and let's talk about you. Let's process your feelings. And then that's to remind you how amazing you are. And that's why you do what you do. Right. And I think that's a big piece of that. And so Kambody, I'm grateful for your thoughts as well. This idea that we, we need to connect, that we're not alone. Our clients are alone, but neither are we. Um, to kind of wrap it all up, this idea, many of the people are here today because this whole purpose is to do's and taboos, but more along the ideas of cultural humility. Um, and what does that look like? And, and so one of the questions that we have on here for our panel, um, and I know that we're running out of time, but just some final thoughts and some ideas is, what's one thing we can do now as clinicians, as professors in classrooms, as individuals in school systems, education systems, working with motivational interviewing, how can we grow personally, starting right now, me individually, with cultural awareness? Um, and Tampany, if it's okay, can we start with you? Yeah, actually, um, you know, I had a couple that I was working with and they were from Bosnia and they, and, and, uh, they referenced the Bosnian war quite a bit. <laughs> and I'm sure we all do this, but you know, I know some stuff about the war, but 
I'm sitting there nodding my head like, mm-hmm. As they're saying, well, you know, this, this, the context of this situation, I'm like, mm-hmm. And then my mind, I'm thinking like, note to self, you probably need to learn about the ins and outs of the Boston War. So I actually ended up like going through the History Channel and like podcasts, and I was just getting really informed, right? I mean, I think as practitioners, we may know a lot of issues generally, um, but to, I think this humility is this idea of being willing to immerse ourselves, right, and, and obtain knowledge around these challenges and it actually was really crucial to working with them just getting the timelines correct like getting where they were in in their development and how that's affected their lives right and and um just the resiliency being here um and and another experience is you know i have a client who is from hong kong and um as many of you know there's there's quite a bit of challenges going on there and it's been very very difficult and this client's actually lamented just how unfair she's felt that, you know, uh, Americans have not really helped them, right? And, and she's just like, you know, we get all, we, we get informed on issues here, but, you know, nobody's helping me there. And I, and I just really empathize with her. And I actually, once again, just like, really try to make sure that I understood, I've been following the news and just make sure that every time we speak, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, did you hear about that? And, um, it's, it's, it's creating a context, right, for the client to be able to speak with. And I don't know, it shows them that I, that I care, that I, you know, there's, there's a humility there that I'm willing to spend my own uh, beliefs and maybe even my own uh, advocacy to, to expand and advocate for their cause as well. And that kind of like solidarity really helps uh, build, build rapport, build trust, and it definitely helps the work. So um, for me, my I appreciate that, Kempsity. Brad, any thoughts, ideas on cultural humility? What can we as individuals right now do to help grow cultural humility? Yeah, there's a quote I love that says that, you know, when the ground and the map don't align, trust the ground. And so I think there's times when we look at, you know, training around things of culture and populations, you know, this is what it should be. And then here's our client. And if they don't fit, you know, we really want to try to trust the client. So I think just this openness to really check in with our clients and not again, even assume what we're talking about now applies to the clients with whom you're working with or what the books say, but just try to really just kind of cultivate a curiosity about who this person is and how culture, broadly speaking, impacts them. You know, what are the strengths? You know, are there liabilities possibly? Like, how is it all kind of coming together? So that's my... I like, thank you, Brad. Martha, what would be some of your advice of cultural, how can we as individuals grow cultural humility? I, um, I'll be brief. So I have two ideas. One, get therapy for yourself. I have my own therapist. I love it. And it helps me to have that safe space where I can like, process at times my own feeling, what's coming up for me. Um, and then the other one, I would say, find a diverse group of colleagues. So then that way you avoid that tunnel vision or that single mindedness. Um, and it may take you uh, out of your comfort zone, but that is what it's all about, right? And hopefully with uh, colleagues in, uh, there's that brave space. Um, so then you can keep growing in a way that doesn't feel judgmental, but then you're letting your, your group, your diverse group point things out, your blind spots and help you grow. Awesome. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Steve, Steven, I apologize. There's two names I've been calling you this whole time, but Steve, my good friend, and Stephen, the professor. So um, I'm going to equally suggest that we hunger and thirst for knowledge, that do not rely on your consumers to educate you as to what their experience is. I think we need to match that by hungering and thirsting for knowledge. And the final piece will probably be um, stay in the now in the process. I think at times as clinicians, we are so quick to want to go to change. We're about arriving at a location with our consumers. And I think some of the best interactions that I've had with my consumers 
from a cultural perspective is staying in this moment at this time and processing the now versus worrying about where we're going. Uh, the now can be very powerful in helping people identify their emotions, their feelings, their perspective, and sharing their story. I think that's one of the best honors for me as a clinician is just allowing people to share who they are, how they are, and what their life experience is. Thank you, Steve. Um, so what, oh, sorry, go ahead, Brad, were you gonna say something? No, oh. just come up here in a second, go ahead, Tina. Okay, so what I hear is one way, um, ways that we can be culturally humble or start practicing it um, is to be informed, to trust the client, be curious about what they're wanting to tell us in their story, Get therapy for yourself. Reach out. Don't assume that you can do it alone because we can't. We're not meant to. That's not how we're built. Um, find diverse group, group of colleagues. Like find people who are different than you. I love it. There's a TED Talk out there where she talks about mentor someone that you would never, ever consider mentoring ever. <laughs> that is completely different from you. That doesn't run in your circles. That is completely outside of, what, of the norm. And you'll be opening doors for them that they didn't even know existed, but they, so vice versa, right? This idea that you get to share in that hunger for knowledge um, and stay in the now. And I really like that, uh, that the stay in the now, be present in the moment. My sister often says that when people are sitting around the couch and everyone has their phone, she'll like slap the phones out of their hands. It's a Polynesian, it's a Tongan thing, it's a Tongan mole anything, but and she'll be like, stay in the moment, present, be present with us, right? This idea of staying in the now and not trying to, I had an awesome yoga teacher that said, forget your imaginary future and your dead past. Stay in the present, be here in this moment. And so I think that's pretty powerful in that idea. Um, and my advice is the same is that you don't know what you don't know. Allow them to be the experts in their lives and allow them to take you on that journey. And, and, and your job is to help navigate that process of where they are and then where they want to be. And I think we're out of time. Is that correct, Brad? Yeah. Well, thanks to everyone. I've, I've learned a lot. So to each of you, thank you. As far as if there's still people on the, the webinar here, we'll post this and you can get some credits for some CEUs. So anyway, thank you all and uh, best wishes. It's been very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye guys. All right, I'm gonna stop this. Do you want to stop? Okay. <laughs> I'm still learning this a little.